Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to this event on renewing American leadership, shaping the future of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, the U.S. Electoral College made it uh, official yesterday. Uh, president uh, uh, Biden will be President-elect Biden will be president on January 20th. Uh, we are joined today by an extraordinary group of speakers, including Swedish Foreign Minister Ann Linda, former National Security Advisor Steve Hadley, former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, and the lineup becomes uh, uh, all the stronger with Alan Lapson, uh, and then uh, my colleague Gideon Rockman uh, moderating the first panel, and Ryan Heath of Politico the second. As the United States prepares to transition to a new presidential administration, the Atlantic Council has brought this event together to shape the thinking on how to renew U.S. leadership in the world. And what we know by listening to Jake Sullivan, uh, the new National Security Advisor, uh, the uh, Secretary of State designee, uh, Tony Blinken, they intend uh, to lead the United States in quite a different direction with a particular emphasis on partners and allies. Uh, the United States remains committed to the idea that robust American leadership and strong democratic alliances and partnerships are essential for the future. Over the course of the event, we'll hear from accomplished speakers on a variety of topics. We begin today with a panel on the Biden administration's opportunity to renew American global leadership and re-energize democratic alliances. Uh, topics to be covered include the, area, uh, the idea of a summit of democracies, which uh, President-elect Biden said he would convene in his first year, and a new Ad Ad Atlantic, Atlantic Charter. This is uh, August, will mark the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter, uh, signed uh, near the beginning of World War II, before the U.S. was even in the war between uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Uh, I would hope this would be more of a global charter of democracies this time and not an Atlantic Charter. Uh, there's a lot of good news already happening. Uh, the European Union came out with its own proposal for a global alliance uh, for the uh, Biden administration. Quote, uh, as open democ uh, this reads from the proposal, uh, quote, as open democratic societies and market economies, the EU and the US agree on the strategic challenge presented by China's growing international assertiveness, even if we do not always agree on the best way to address this. And this pro proposal encompasses everything from climate to our uh, uh, differences on, on, on the digital uh, privacy and big tech. Um, uh, we do believe at the Atlantic Council that this could be a period as important as the end of World War I and World War II in terms of shaping the global future together with partners and allies. The Atlantic Council has been at the forefront of thinking through the values that should guide uh, democracies in the 21st century. In 2019, the Atlantic Council, with a nonpartisan task force co-chaired by Steve Hadley and Madeleine Albright, uh, released a Declaration of Principles for Freedom, Prosperity, and Peace, which outlined seven core principles to guide free nations that could be the basis of such a charter. We will conclude today's events with a panel on global risks, looking ahead to the trends, challenges, and opportunities facing the Biden administration as well as U.S. allies and partners more broadly. This week, the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security will be publishing a paper on the top 10 risks uh, and opportunities for 2021, which we encourage uh, everyone to read. Tomorrow, the two-day long event will continue, this two-day long event will continue with panels on the domestic underpinnings of American power and allied strategy for China, again, a theme of the Biden administration of the Biden campaign. We'll also be releasing quite an important paper on uh, China, uh, uh, strategy toward China. I, I hope you'll all read that when it's released tomorrow. To the viewers, if you would like to have a question considered during today's event, tweet it using the hashtag uh, renewing US leadership. So hashtag renewing US leadership. Uh, and that question may be asked by a moderator. With that, I want to thank again the moderators and speakers. Thank you also to our viewers joining us. I look forward to uh, our agenda today, and I now turn the floor to Ambassador Dan Freed 
and uh, the Scowcroft Center's uh, Chief of Staff, Caroline Multerer, to introduce our first panel. Thank you, Fred. <clears throat> President-elect Biden has spoken of democracy as an organizing principle for American foreign policy, and he's not alone. Boris Johnson has announced that he wants to change the G7 summit into a D10 summit, inviting uh, India, South Korea, Australia to join. Um, EU Foreign Minister Yusuf Burrell has talked about the United States and Europe as being democratic partners uh, to help, help tackle current problems. Now the Biden administration is about to make the transition from campaigning to governing. So this panel addressing the issues features two experienced practitioners of foreign policy, how to take principles, foreign policy articles, papers, and translate them into policy that generates good results. Democracy as an organizing principle has been at the heart of some of the best American foreign policy and in partnership with Europe and other great democracies for 75 years. But no organizing principle is a guarantee against policy failures and it doesn't execute itself. It needs help. How to go from principles to reality, how to avoid the traps is going to be among the challenges in the next period. But looking ahead, these are, these are better problems to have than perhaps debating among ourselves whether democracy should even be at the center of the international system. Um, I look forward to today's discussion and it is a pleasure to be here, um, especially the day after the US presidential election was formally sealed. And I turn it over to my colleague, Carolyn Melchor, um, for the next word. Thank you, Ambassador Freed. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Multerer. I'm the Chief of Staff of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. For a rising generation, the concept of American glo global leadership won't be defined by the past. It will depend on how America steps up for the most pressing issues and the most insidious threats. Climate change, systemic racism, disinformation, and a global pandemic loom large. For this reason, we must go beyond renewing global leadership. We must redefine it. It must meet the demands of the modern world. It must be inclusive, amplifying voices and perspectives that have been sidelined for too long. And it must, without a shred of doubt, restore America's alliances. Our foundation will illuminate our future, but only if we're willing to serve its most sacred promises and meet the moment. At the Atlantic Council, we believe that we are stronger with our allies and partners, and it's our mission to shape the global future together. Through some of our most important and core work, we have demonstrated our commitment to the democratic values which bind us together. The Atlantic Council launched the Declaration of Principles for Freedom, Prosperity, and Peace, an initiative to revitalize, adapt, and defend a rules-based order. The initiative convened a high-level task force of distinguished former officials representing leading democracies around the world to chart a course of action. The Declaration of Principles serves as a North Star for democracies worldwide as it offers a clear and compelling statement of values around which political leaders of those democracies can coalesce. The Declaration articulates seven fundamental principles of a rules-based order. Recognizing, however, that such principles are not self-executing, the Declaration also outlines the tasks ahead that are necessary to implement those principles and advance common goals. Additionally, the Scowcroft Center's Democratic Order Initiative leads the charge on advancing democratic values. The D10 Strategy Forum brings together top plan policy planning officials and strategy experts from 10 leading democracies at the forefront of building and maintaining the rules-based democratic order. Participants in this D10 have demonstrated the commitment to shared values and interests and possess the requisite diplomatic, economic, and military resources to act on a global scale. Our first panel will address this question of American global leadership and the Biden administration's opportunity to re-energize democratic alliances. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Gideon Rockman, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for the Financial Times. Mr. Rockman has previously worked for The Economist and BBC News. 
In 2016, he won the Orwell Prize for Political Journalism. And in the same year, he was awarded the Commentator Award at the European Press Prize Awards. Mr. Ruckman, over to you. Apologies about that. <laughs> All I was saying was uh, thank you very much uh, for the introductions from Carolyn, Dan, Fred. Uh, good to be here. And um, let's get straight into the panel and into the discussions. We're delighted to be joined by Anna Lindt, the uh, Foreign Minister of Sweden, and by Stephen Hadley, who was National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush. Um, Anna Lindt, if I, I could ask you first, um, I can't see you on the screen, but I'm assuming you can see me. Um, there's a lot of talk now about the um, Global Democratic Alliances. You, you heard that before, but this is an idea that's been around for quite a while. Do you think its time has come now? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think that it's very important that we have a very conscious work on supporting uh, democracy because uh, uh, as we know, and I'm going to speak about that a little bit later, it's a backsliding, very, very, you know, strong backsliding of democracy. And if the if the United States is not uh, taking leadership in promoting democracy and making alliances with other countries and also the civil society, uh, this is a bad sign for democracy. So I'm so very excited by President-elect Biden's talk about a global summit for democracy and that we can continue the way that, for example, Madeleine Albright worked several years ago, but I have taken part in many activities that she was introducing and that she was kind of being helping so that other partners came with. I think it's without doubt necessary. Okay, well, I, I mean, I'm sure it's not too controversial a statement to say that I think most people in the European Union were relieved that uh, Joe Biden won the presidency. Um, but how much has your... Not all. No, not all, I agree. There were one or two of your people sitting around the conference table who probably weren't, Victor Orban perhaps, and others. But, uh, but how much has faith in America's ability to lead a global alliance of democracies been shaken by the last four years of the Trump administration? Well, I think there is uh, actually a lot of, of things to you know, go back to because uh, the last four years, even if uh, most of, of our countries have had good relation with the United States, because we need to, there has been a certain lack of issues like multilateralism, democracy, um, uh, human rights issue, women rights issue, uh, climate issues, those issues that we have cooperated a lot uh, among European uh, countries and, uh, and the United States that, we, that has been lacking. And I think that uh, that's why we are looking um, forward to this new underlining of uh, uh, the need for a leadership when it comes to uh, democracy, and I will, uh, I will, I will say a little bit later about how we work with it because uh, I have been very, very worried. We have in Sweden one of the most prestigious university varieties of democracy in Gothenburg, who who has gone through all different aspects of democracy and can say a clear decline in so many aspects of democracy. So it's it's not just um, you know, a feeling we have, it's for real. And what they say also is that uh, it takes about four years to um, you know, um, uh, take away a full democracy. And then it could take a lot of years to bring it back again. Okay, well, that's a very sobering thought. So Steve Hadley, if I could bring you in. Uh, it looks in a way as if the Biden administration is pushing at an open door when it talks about th this being the time for the world's democracies to work together. How do you think they should go about it? And do you think it may prove less straightforward once you get into it? I think it may be prove a little bit less straightforward. I think in the history, you know, in the administration I served, George W. Bush administration, I think many of our European allies thought we had a little too much U.S. leadership during that time. 
I think in subsequent years, as U.S. is disengaged and become less active on the kinds of issues that the minister uh, described, uh, people began to see the, the problem with a less engaged, less active United States. So I think there is some appetite for a return, but I think the question is how does the United States return to a global role? Leadership has the connotation in some sense of, of uh, 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 a, a, a heavy handed approach. I, I, you know, it used to be that when the United States would make an initiative, we would have an interagency debate. And once we would get a consensus about what the initiative should look like, we'd go to our European allies and others and say, this is an initiative, would you all sign on? And when they would want to change some features, we would say, well, we've got a consensus within the government. We can't let that erode. I think we have to have a different kind of leadership that sounds as much in partnership as in traditional leadership, engaging with our friends and allies, listening to our friends and allies, developing policies and initiatives with them rather than develop them first within the U.S. government and then in some sense presenting them to our friends and allies. So I like a phrase that Dan Fried has talked about, the U.S., Europe and other allies partners in leadership of the global community. I think that's really what we're, we're looking towards, which means the United States re-engages, is inactive on issues, but does it in a different way, reflecting the different international environment in which we operate and the need and desire of, of our allies and friends to take more responsibility for their own future. Again, in partnership rather than in anything that looks like subservience to American leadership. Okay, well, one further question from me, and then I, I know Dan would like to ask some questions to, to both of you, but it seems to me that a lot of this uh, is driven by concern about the rise of China, a massive authoritarian power. Um, any effort to balance Chinese power obviously has to involve Asian partners. Um, Boris Johnson, as Dan was noting, has, has, has invited a D10, which includes India. Now, India is in many ways the world's greatest democracy, but it's also, you know, if you listen to Indian liberals showing increasing authoritarian tendencies within the Modi government, uh, its treatment of the courts, the press, and so on. I guess that's always a slight issue with um, balancing embracing democracies, but at, at what point are you able to actually criticize and say, well, you know, even within our club, we're going to hold each other to account? Or is the strategic need to balance China going to mean that we actually have to be quiet about any misgivings we might have about India or anywhere else? I think we have to do both. I think we do need to galvanize, as the minister suggested, our common commitment to democratic values. Uh, to uh, stand up for them and model them in our own domestic behavior. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and, and also to encourage our friends and allies to uh, move in the direction of greater democracy and freedom, which, you know, democracy is a journey, it's not an end state. And we're all traveling down that road and we need to be encouraging and helping one another to do that. At the same time we do that, we have to recognize that Engaging China requires not just the democracies, it requires, in some sense, uh, a, a larger grouping of, of, of countries. Uh, we, without that, we will not have the weight necessary in order to convince China that it needs to change its policies and come more in accord with the international consensus. You know, the United States now has less than 25% of the global GDP. People project that China will pass the United States within a decade. Uh, if the United States is friends and allies, both Democrat and evolving states, I would say, uh, join together in a common uh, strategy with respect to China, we have close to 60% of the world's GDP. That is more likely to get China's attention. So we've got to both strengthen the democratic core, but at the same time, not be exclusive and to be able to work from that democratic core with other states on issues like uh, developing a common strategy with respect to China. Okay, so democracy is at the core, but not as an exclusive club. Now, Dan, Fried, if you're still somewhere hovering in the background, I know you would like to ask a couple of questions. So uh, can I hand over to you if you're there? I'm here. 
The, I agree with Steve Hadley's point that we've got to strengthen the democratic core and reach out beyond it. I also want to um, foot stomp Carolyn Mulcher's point that I think was spot on that a community of democracies or an al alliances of democracies have to be inclusive and they have to address current problems not look back. So I have my question is a question for practitioners, for Foreign Minister Linda and Steve Hadley. I was thinking about the summit of democracies or summit for democracies, and I just had a, a kind of panic attack over a Biden administration debating for months who's on the invitation list and who is not, and debating criteria and spending six months you know, of inter agency meetings and papers and losing sight of what it is we're trying to accomplish. So I think the idea of strengthening the core of democracies, starting with the US and reaching out beyond it is spot on. How do you do that? How do you strengthen the core without getting into six months of debate about, you know, is Mexico a democracy or not? Do you invite Poland and not Hungary? What about Turkey? What? How do you keep this from being all Europeans and Americans? Um, you know, what about India? If you could advise the incoming Biden administration, which is going to have to face translating policy pay, campaign policy papers into reality sooner than they, you know, it's happening soon. What's your advice? I know this is practical and operational, but that's the space we're going to be in and it's important that these ideas that the ideas of democratic partnership and leadership succeed but your advice would be great i don't know whether foreign minister linda wants to have first crack at that because in a way it's something you've had to think about within the eu itself because you're attempting to take action against Poland and Hungary just this week, you had to have these this debate about uh, rule of law criteria. So how, do, how can, is it possible to finesse this question of who's in the club and who's out? Well, I don't think that's <clears throat> the most important question, actually. Uh, I think that, I mean, as, as, as a country, we have uh, been working uh, for a long time to promote and support the democratic institutions and, and, and development. and. Uh, we are. Uh, we actually put a lot of money uh, as a country uh, to to human rights, democracy, rule of law, uh, or uh, to try to enabling for a, for a strong civil society to to take part and uh, to counter this narrative, this this backsliding of democracy. We started last year something we call uh, drive for democracy. And that means that all our embassies and all our consulates, there's 108 all over the world, um, they have to put democracy in the uh, center of all foreign policy uh, consideration. Um, and that's uh, including in uh, security, development aid, trade. Uh, and um, we have started those democracy talks in each country depending on what the situation is and that means we need to have democracy talks also in those countries where there is a lack of democracy or a flaw of uh, de democracy um, and then it, it's uh, up to the embassies and the diplomats to find way to discuss uh, democracy i mean so far we have had 70 democracy talks nine thousand participants 600 democracy related activities reach 1.7 million people so it, it really has an impact and, uh, and that's one of the good things uh, i mean there are so many bad things coming in but when i read those reports from our embassies and and consulates about how they have secret meetings in an african country where um, lgbti people don't have any human rights or democracy rights and our embassy has, has managed to have talks with them. How can they 
um, uh, work to get their their rights uh, broader. When I go, for example, uh, Jordania, our embassy said, how should we discuss this in the best way? And they found out that the, the king has seven principles that is ruling the whole country. Why don't we take those principles and we start to have discussions with politicians, um, human rights activists, uh, um, uh, limited of course uh, um, and uh, civil society starting in the the king the the absolute king's uh, seven principles how can we turn that into talk of democracy to strengthen uh, democracy and so on and so forth and of course uh, i mean the issue of uh, um, um, women and men and and um, and uh, equality and uh, we are a feminist foreign policy and we can see a real backlash when it comes to gender issues uh, a week ago i was in three foreign ministers meeting in a week the nato uh, foreign minister meeting because we are partner the osce minister meeting and the eu minister meeting and um, what we see everywhere is now a backlash from authoritarian countries on the concept of gender. Uh, just two examples. We have uh, uh, take a lot of ministerial resolutions in OSCE. The United States is, of course, one of the 57 members. Uh, two resolution. I thought, in my naivete, that it was not a problem. It was how do we implement United um, Nations Security Council 1325 of uh, weakness and, and security in the OSCE veto by Russia and some others? How do we um, get the OSCE panels to be more uh, gender equal? Veto. Uh, we had uh, the situation both uh, we talked to in the United Nations, where I now try to take away everything that say gender equality, gender based violence, anything like that, uh, because that is not, no, not uh, anything that we should work for anymore. And it's a, that's a, also a kind of democracy by pushing back the rights of women, the equality issues that we need to to bring up to the surface and make visible again yeah it sometimes struck me actually listening to what you have to say that for the russias and that maybe china as well part of what they're doing is appealing to more conservative social forces within our own societies saying all of you who are unhappy about gender equality or gay rights we're the we're the we're the true champions of of your beliefs but anyway uh let me uh put dan Fried's question to steve hadley uh, Steve, you heard this sort of nightmare vision of, uh, of a great idea being bogged down in some interagency discussion about who should get an invite, what is a democracy. How do you avoid that? I th think that the uh, foreign minister has given us some great advice about how to pursue this democracy agenda. Uh, I think uh, it is difficult. This whole notion of a summit of democracies requires you to decide who's in, who's out. And a lot of those decisions, I don't think we want to make. I don't want to give up on Hungary and Poland and the like. You know, the whole notion of bringing them into the EU was that if you made them part of the family democracies over time, they would become more democratic. I don't want to give up on that principle. I don't want to give up on the possibility that over time, China and Russia will also ultimately move in a more democratic way. So how do you go about this? I think the way you start is you, you take the D10, those case, you take the G7, you make it a D10, where, where democracy commitment and practice uh, is very much a criteria of inclusion. You stop there and you make that your call, core, and then you reach out in a, a, a number of different ways, very much like the foreign minister suggested. And I would hope that our European friends and allies would engage with the new administration on this whole issue of a D10 so that um, they can in inform the Biden administration and maybe change the concept of a democracy summit to something like D10 
plus an active engagement program. I want to say one more thing, though. We have to recognize that part of the decline of democracies is the decline of democratic practice and success within our own societies. The most compelling way to promote democracy is to model it ourselves. And both in Europe and the United States, we are not looking so good. We have, uh, we have politics that is very fractious, political systems that do not seem to be able to solve long-standing problems in the United States, whether it's migration or, or entitlements. We have an economic system that is not producing inclusive growth. And we have a, a whole administrative system that is not very efficient as effective or effective as we've seen in our response to COVID-19. So if you really want to promote democracy, we've got to model it at home to restore our confidence of our own people in our democratic values and in our democratic systems, and then be able to, to refresh the brand of democratic governance overseas by how we perform here at home. So I think this whole motion of, I agree with everything the foreign minister said, but I would add that we need to start refurbishing and refreshing our democracies here at home, making them more effective uh, in order to win back the support of our own peoples and to be able to model this behavior internationally. That is the way ultimately we're gonna bring uh, populations and countries more in the democratic fold. Yeah, I mean, you make, you make what seems to me a very important point, but to add to the list of you know, democratic dysfunction at, at, at this moment. You know, we're all relieved that the Electoral College has certified the, the election, but you have an outgoing president saying the last US presidential election was rigged, stolen, large parts of his party prepared to go along with that. I mean, as somebody who served in a Republican administration, do you think the Republican Party uh, will be undermining this democratic message by actually saying, no, no, American democracy is deeply sick, the last election was stolen, etc. Or do you think you can get back to something closer to a, a sort of a joint presentation to the outside world of two parties confident and supporting the health of their own democracy? I think we can. I think it will take some time. Uh, Trump, uh, President Trump has been a powerful political player, uh, and he has enormous support within the Republican Party. But I think when time passes and people consider it, what we've seen is a wonderful demonstration of the strength of American democracy. Look, in the face of COVID, we had to completely change most of our electoral procedures uh, on a state by state basis, some of the states not resolving those procedures until right up to the election, notwithstanding a very different electoral process. The American people turned out in greater percentage numbers than since 1908. Over 66% of eligible voters voted. Uh, and then in the face of extreme both litigation properly in, instituted by the Trump administration and some extrajudicial pressure from the Trump administration, uh, uh, judges, over 80 judges, some Democrats, some Republicans, some appointed by Trump, all stood by the rule of law in our electoral system, as did officials down to the county electoral official level, Republicans and Democrats. They stood by the rule of law and they defended the electoral system that produced a, a free and fair election. I think as time passes, that's going to sink in on people. And if President Biden is able to lead from the center to try to do it on a bipartisan basis, uh, and over time, I think and hope Republicans will respond. And if we can show that bipartisan governance still works in this country and that actually we can solve some of these longstanding problems we've had, I think we're, we're beginning uh, the long road back in terms of reconnecting, quite frankly, with our own populations and refreshing our brand and the image uh, of democracy uh, internationally. Okay. Um, Foreign Minister uh, Lind, uh, you talked about the work that's been done by the University of Gothenburg and by others on democratic erosion and there's very worrying trends which have been going on for, you know, 15 years, maybe more. What do you think is driving it? I mean, what are the, your conclusions? Because I guess until we try to figure out why this is happening, it's quite hard to combat it. Why, after all the confidence after the end of the Cold War, that there was only one way, end of history, etc., did things start to go into reverse? Well, as 
think uh, one reason is uh, the the uh, uh, authoritarianism uh, that uh, several parties has uh, found that it's uh, possible to gain votes uh, and uh, uh, one reason that we are more and more looking at is the social inequalities uh, and the uh, economic reason for why people uh, are um, uh, protesting and going to populist parties and we can see also in some countries there have been even uh, uh, uproars that has led to very very difficult situation in chile in iran in iraq in uh, um, lebanon where the growing social injustice has led to uh, the the uh, uh, the answer, putting the, the politicians to answer, and the politicians has answered in a very populistic way, saying that uh, there is the issue of the other, as we have, uh, you know, many, many times looking for scapegoats, making the issue of um, immigration on the center of the agenda in many of the European countries. And what I mean in immigration, I mean in a negative way that you put uh, all, all the blame on uh, immigrants and it's uh, all it's all over uh, in the European countries and in some countries we see really, really bad development in trying to, you know, push the blame and, uh, and also in a violent way. So all those issues uh, of growing inequality. Uh, growing uh, social injustice, uh, populism that gives votes, giving easy answers to difficult questions, that gives rise to um, a backlash for uh, democracy. And that's why yeah. I think it's important that we, that we lift this up and take it seriously. I have been, I was Minister of European Affairs before I was Minister of Foreign Affairs. And and what I could see is that the, uh, when we were trying to deal with the lack of uh, the rule of law, democracy and human rights in some of our member countries, the tools we had has not worked. Uh, we were sitting for hours and hours using something that we call in the EU the Article 7, meaning that if you are not uh, following the rule of law, democracy and human rights, then you start a procedure uh, and in the end you can ultimately lose your voting rights or you could also lose uh, money <laughs> to, to put it simple but it didn't work because um, to get in the first step you have to have unanimity and Hungary and Poland always say that we will always vote for each other there will never be a unanimity unanimity and now, uh, for those of you who has followed what has happened in, um, in, the, United, in the European Union the last half year with uh, the seven year budget and the big Corona uh, fund to be, have seen how difficult it has been to put a conditionality that you will not get money if you don't follow democracy, rule of law and human rights. Now we have a very, very, you know, a compromise that we, the, the leaders could agree to on the um, summit on Thursday and Friday. But it has shown that when you have the undemocratic forces inside uh, your own organization, then it, it is very difficult. And we have yeah. not found tools enough. And I, I hope that it, it, yeah, I mean, that, as you said, it'll be, it'll, no, uh, sorry to interrupt. I mean, as you said, that was a very important unfolding debate within Europe about Hungary and Poland. But before I go back to Steve Hadley, can I just ask you a, a, for a relatively brief response on the situation in Sweden itself? Because there was a period when the American right were holding up Sweden as an example of this dysfunctional society being ripped apart by controversies over migration. And maybe that was very excessive, but you do have a party ironically enough, called the Sweden Democrats, who are a far right party, who are at about 20% in the polls. So how uh, inoculated, if I can use a vaccine word, is Sweden against anti-democratic threats, even in your own country? 
Uh, no, I mean, we are, like any other country, uh, a normal European country, and uh, uh, we have to fight this as uh, uh, any other countries. But we have to make it a political priority, because if we don't make it a political priority, it will just uh, continue. And we tried several different ways. Where for, for example, when it came to the Swedish Democrats, for, for many years, they were not invited to any discussions because we thought if we are just quiet, they will, uh, you know, they will not grow. This didn't work. Um, and then we said, okay, we take the debate. Uh, and uh, still, uh, they managed to get the brown. They have now 17%. Um, and they are an uh, anti-immigration uh, populist party uh, with uh, a very uh, you know, dark back, historical background. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's difficult for other parties when you see that you actually gain votes on having these simplistic uh, views and the simplistic answers not to fall into it. We try from the government side uh, and uh, we work together with the Liberal Party and Centre Party and the Green Party to um, go against this. But I will not say it's easy uh, because it's always easier to come with, uh, with uh, simple answers. Uh, and I say we should not do that. I mean, we should try to race uh, above that. But it's not easy. Okay. Um, Steve Hadley, if I could come back to you. I mean, Obviously, Europeans are eager to have the Americans back in the game. Joe Biden is talking a lot about American leadership. But all, equally, the Democrats, Biden himself, talk about the need to refocus on American society, the, the divisions within the country that drove the rise of Trump and so on. And in particular, they're very reluctant to sign new trade deals without uh, sign off from labor organizations, environmental organizations. Do you worry that in this effort to rebuild a community of democracies, rebuild American leadership, America's going to be doing this without one very important tool in its armory, which is uh, the, an offer on trade? And China has just uh, is a member of RCEP, this big new trade deal in, Amer in, in the Asia Pacific, and the US isn't. Uh, we can get back, I think, to trade deals, but we have to address problems at home first and fix our own democratic platform at home before we can address it internationally. Look, the rise of the Tea Party movement, the rise of, of the election of, of President Trump in 2016 was because a significant portion of the American people felt victimized by globalization, threatened by immigration, uh, betrayed by their politicians and ignored by elites. Uh, they, they had real grievances that were not being dressed by economic, political, and social, that were not being dressed by our political and economic system. Those have to be addressed. I think President-elect Biden understands that. They need to be addressed. We need to reconnect uh, inclusively with the American people and, re and convince the American people once again that our democratic system can respond to these felt needs and grievances and real social, economic, and political problems. Once we do that, we will have a firm foundation for dealing with the issue of promoting democracy, again, by our example, internationally. Why is it that we're, our brand is a bit in eclipse internationally? It is because it used to be that democracies could claim that they both re reflected the highest aspirations of the human spirit for freedom, they provided economic prosperity, and they provided effective governance. If you look at our, our, our performance over the last 20 years in the United States, and I would say in Europe as well, we don't look so good. Whereas mm -hmm. the Chinese model is, looks like a model that whatever its, uh, it, its uh, breaches of human rights and failure to reflect fundamental values is producing economic growth and an effective system that was able to manage the coronavirus better than anybody else. We're getting beat in the competition between authoritarian state capitalism and democratic free market capitalism. We got to fix our problems at home, reconnect our own populations to our values, and from that plan for demonstrate to the world 
the superiority of our model. That's yeah, really I, I can understand the, totally the emphasis on rebuilding at home first before you get back into the game of uh, international trade deals. You do so both. On. You do both. Right. You can't sequence. you got to do both together. And as you build it at home, you enhance your ability and your platform internationally. you got to do I guess both what parallel. What I was getting at, but you partly answered me, but I'll push you a bit more. Uh, sure. Is is the world going to wait for you? Because, uh, you know, it, I can understand the domestic reasons for going slow on trade, but China's biggest offer really is the dynamism of its economy, the amount of investment it can offer, one belt, one road, now showing up even in, in Europe. And I suspect that, you know, countries havering between the West and China will say, well, it's lovely, you're offering us democratic values and they're offering us hard cash. So maybe we'll, we'll take the cash. Uh, I think, one, I'm, I'm not really suggesting anybody wait. The challenge of the Biden administration is they've got to do about 10 things all at once in parallel. On trade, I still believe there is an opportunity. You look at the, our, I'm no trade lawyer, but you look at RCEP. Uh, it's basically limited to goods, not services. It doesn't deal with state-owned enterprises, doesn't do much with labor provisions, doesn't deal much with the environment. It's a very limited agreement. This, the way is still open for a much more modern trade agreement. Look, the president was able to renegotiate with Canada and Mexico, a trade agreement that, that passed pretty overwhelmingly with the, the Congress. So I think mm -hmm. there is a way back on the right kind of trade agreement that does address the grievances people had with the prior trade agreements. That's the way forward. Okay. We're coming to the last few minutes. Uh, the question from social media, which uh, very much, I think, for the foreign minister, uh, which says, authoritarian regimes in Europe are rolling back gender equality measures. What would an active women's movement look like in response to this? Uh, one ongoing case study, Belarus. Well, thank you, um, and thank you for your question, because that's uh, uh, one of the very burning questions that we have, and that's the backlash uh, of the gender issues. And uh, we started a, already in 2014 a feminist uh, foreign policy, and now we have several countries who have followed uh, Canada, Mexico, um, Spain, France, uh, other countries. And what we have to do is to always uh, put on our gender glasses. And since you talk about trade, uh, let me take one example that, that I think it's, it's quite uh, uh, illuminating on this. Because um, um, when, when, uh, when I was Minister of Trade, we say, OK, let's have a feminist trade policy. What's that? Um, is, there, is there anything like that? And we started to try to find uh, data if there was differences when it comes to trade on men and women. And we saw that when it comes to tariffs, you had six times as high tariff on a woman's silk blouse than in a man's shirt. You saw when you looked at uh, gymnastic clothes, sports clothes, there were, um, uh, I don't remember exactly the the, uh, the figures, but say it was like 30% tariffs on, on uh, women's sports clothes and seven on men's sports clothes. And nobody could explain why is it like that? It's just, uh, it, it's just a gender inequality. And then we started to look at, at the off, area after area, we could see the same uh, inequalities. So then we have to try to do something about it. Uh, when we come to women, peace and security, now when um, the 1st of January, I will become and my country will become the, the chairperson of the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And then we will work with women, peace and security, because we know for a fact that if you have women in peace negotiations, a uh, peace deal is more sustainable, then there is uh, a lot of research about that. It has to do, for one thing, that women has other contact points in a society, meaning that they are bearer of a peace uh, deal more 
uh, effectively than, than uh, men are. And also to demand that when the mission leaders, I just talked to the mission leader of the Ukrainian mission, the Transnistrian mission, and so on, the, uh, that they put in also a gender perspective. Do we have uh, women troops? Uh, do we see to what this um, problem means for women? When I, in, in um, March, just before the pandemic, I have to say, when I visited the contact line in Luhansk in Ukraine, you have to go with military helicopter there. Then um, I saw how the conflict is, uh, uh, get, <laughs> is affecting women in other ways because on uh, the contact line was going right through where the mothers went with the, for their playgrounds and the daycare center and when they have cu cut it off they have nowhere to go with the children and they had uh, the small bridge where all the pensioners has to walk over to get their pensions it's nearly one kilometers and those old ladies who have to go there they didn't have any possibilities other ways to go so it was the everyday life was affecting women and girls in another way than they were affecting men and if you don't have that perspective then you can't do anything about it when i was talking now um, uh, a month ago at uh, the highest um, decisive uh, body in uh, in NATO, the North Atlantic Council, there was one of the ambassadors who said, we are starting to think of uh, um, having a feminist defense policy. What advice would you give me? And then I think, uh, I thought, well, we have come a step forward. I've never heard that before, a feminist really? defense. <laughs> so I just told him, yeah, I just told him, put your gender glasses on and we will make that happen too. Okay, well, we've only got a couple more minutes, so I'll just round off by giving Steve Hadley an opportunity for some concluding thoughts. But also, I'd like your reaction to what the Foreign Minister Lynn said, because it struck me listening to her. Should this, these, you know, feminist defence policy, feminism, and generally cultural issues, be part of the offer of democrat of a community of democracies? Uh, something that brings them together, that can unite them? Or are you concerned that, you know, some of the more conservative democracies might actually uh, take, take issue with that and it could actually become a dividing line? They may take issue with it. They may become a dividing line, but that's not a reason not to do it. How can you, in a, an effort to promote democracy, not take into account the perspective of half of your population? So I think the minister is absolutely right. We've got particularly men who have to find a way to put on gender glasses uh, and look at these issues uh, in the kind of way and the kind of concrete research that the foreign minister was talking about on the impact of trade agreements, for example, and the, the role women play in sustainable peace agreements. There's data on all of this. There are facts and we need to look at the facts, uh, let them be part of the policy process and inform the policies we pursue. Uh, so look, how this sorts out, uh, I, you know, I, on particular issues will have to be worked out, but there's real data there. We need to, to have a, a gender perspective on this, these issues. It's not the only perspective. We talk about it because it's been a missing perspective that we need to add. And I think this administration, the Biden administration, uh, will be helpful in that regard. I saw something in the paper, and I'm probably going to get these uh, facts wrong, but suggested that something like eight of the 18 cabinet appointments that uh, President-elect Biden has made so far, half of them are women. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good, that's a good place to start. Okay, well, Steve Hadley, uh, Foreign Minister Anne Lind, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, if I was occasionally glancing down, it's because I found the conversation so interesting. I was taking copious notes as you spoke, and I'm sure many others were also taking notes, listening very hard. It was a great uh, way of getting this two-day seminar underway. Thanks to the Atlantic Council for asking me to moderate it and giving me that opportunity. And now I'll hand back to the Atlantic Council folk who will take you forward with the next uh, bit of the seminar.